So this is the simulation software. It, this is kind of how it starts. Um, and uh, you can do a bunch of things. I think in this class, you haven't seen me use this quite yet before. Uh, I don't know if uh, I have posted this. Um, so, so just to illustrate uh, what this uh, simulation can do, I've used it for uh, this um, <laughs> uh, Newton's Cradle uh, simulation before. Let's see. Um, let me just kill the, can I? Um, no, let me do it this way. Um, so it's a, uh, you can do uh, things that uh, appear realistic. Um, I think maybe the thing to do is okay. Uh, you can, the benefit of a simulation is that it helps you visualize the situations. Um, so in the face-to-face -face lecture, I do, I really like to use, uh, lecture demos. And with online class, it's hard to do that. But what I can do is to illustrate a physical situation and kind of show you what it looks like. So here, it's this is a model of Newton's cradle. And when I pull this out and then let go, then it does this. And that's what you would see in Newton's cradle. Um, so you might see me using this once we get to energy and whatnot. I think it's after you get time one. So, um, so that's that. Um, for today, what I want to use this for is to illustrate projectile motion, kind of uh, sh um, show it to you at the level at which you might have seen projectile motion before, and um, and kind of go a little bit uh, into why we do the things we do when we. Uh, when we are trying to solve projectile motion questions. So that it's more than just a list of formulas for you to blindly apply. Um, but you understand the thinking behind why certain things are done in a certain way. So let me just set up the uh, projectile motion uh, first. So I have a projectile. Um, when I was trying this out earlier, it kind of looked better when it was just black so that it doesn't have any distracting colors. So let me do that. Um, so I can uh, kind of set an initial condition for this projectile. You can see that uh, the simulation hasn't started yet. Let me set initial condition for projectile so that it has some X component of velocity, Y component of velocity, and the way it works out, it'll be flying off at 45 degrees. And when I let the simulation run, that's uh, the projectile motion. <laughs> and hopefully none of that looks <laughs> unfamiliar. That's kind of what you expected to see when someone talks about projectile motion. And by the way, this is what you'll be doing in the lab. You'll be throwing balls. You'll be recording videos of that and analyzing the video, uh, not with a simulation, with a real object. So um, one benefit of simulation is I can do certain things that very difficult to do, um, that are very difficult to do in, with a kind of real life object. One, that motion can happen super quickly. So I can slow it down so that I'll have more time to talk and uh, you can kind of have time to look at the motion <laughs> in a more relaxed way. I can put tracers on these uh, objects so that, um, so that you know, if you missed it as it was moving, then you have a little bit more time to look at um, what, uh, what's going on. Um, so, all right, let me run it again. So, yeah, maybe that's a little bit too slow. But that's kind of projectile motion at an intuitive level. It's something that you might have seen before, uh, you know, projectile motion, parabola. Um, we, um, I guess that, uh, that's kind of the level at which uh, a lot of people can see projectile motion in an intuitive way. And this kind of parabolic shape, you see it in so many contexts that sometimes you uh, sometimes it's easy to confuse when you see a parabola in a like a real life space kind of parabola versus parabola in a height versus time graph. Um, so anyways, but uh, that's a kind of at an intuitive level. And with this, this simulation, I can do a little bit more. I can uh, plot uh, things that, um, which is what you will be doing in the lab too, except in the lab, it will take more effort because we have to track it manually and then plot it. In the simulation, because the simulation kind of starts out with the whole thing, I can just uh, have a plot. So this is the, uh, it, the 
this simulation will be plotting um, the, the dynamic parameters related to the circle, this circle here. And it will be plotting the time on the x-axis. And it says it's plotting the speed on the y-axis. I'm going to be changing that in a bit. Oh, wait, I need to point there. <laughs> I'm going to be changing that in a bit, but let me um, just run it at once so that you see what that looks like. So what that looks like. Um, so you see another parabola, but it's upside down for some reason. And uh, if this starts to start looking a little confusing, I, I think that's great because um, what you see with the speed graph is not something that you will see a lot in this class or any class ever really, because when you are trying to think in terms of um, speed in a projectile motion, it, it doesn't yield any um, insight. It doesn't give you any way to, it, it doesn't give you a way to analyze the motion in a way that kind of makes you think like, uh, oh, I learned something new that I didn't realize before. And it's the same deal if I were to do this. So I can, uh, I, because this is simulation, I can do things like visualizing the velocity. So if I visualize the velocity, you will see the motion and it'll kind of feel like, uh, yeah, velocity decreases, increases again there. I don't think I learned anything new. Great, <laughs> let's move on. So what I want to show, uh, I think this will be, sorry, let me try to move this a little bit here. Um, so what I want to, um, what I want to demonstrate here is the reason we do the things we do when we analyze a projectile motion mathematically. So one of the things you will have seen us do, especially if you work through homework and watch the lecture videos and all that, is you will have seen us, the very first step in solving projectile motion is breaking your, uh, breaking your um, motion into components. Oh, wait, I hide the menu item. So in this simulation, it can, I can show components of the vector I'm visualizing. So the simulation is showing this velocity vector. And when you just look at this velocity vector as an arrow throughout the whole motion, it doesn't yield anything that's easy for you to analyze. It just shows an arrow that's changing in direction, changing in magnitude. It's difficult to analyze that. But once you have components displayed, then you can notice something that maybe you haven't seen before. So let me do that now. Um, so running the simulation again. So I hope you noticed something distinct happening with the X component and with the Y component. In case you missed it, let me do it one more time and actually let me change the plot here. So in the plot, um, so with the speed, what I'm plotting is the magnitude of this velocity vector. And I don't have to plot that. And in fact, you know, that doesn't really show me anything that's, uh, again, insightful. So let me plot the X and Y components of velocity instead. And when I run the simulation again, this is what you see. So you see the way the X and Y components of velocity are changing. Uh, shows you something distinctive, something that will be useful in analyzing this motion. The X component, if you have noticed this visual earlier, you see that uh, the magnitude of the X component doesn't, or the X component of velocity doesn't change. And that's this, uh, I guess that's cyan. That's the cyan graph here. That um, it's changing a little bit because this simulation actually simulates air resistance, but you can say within that kind of experimental error, the X component is not changing. And you can see that the Y component, it's initially might have been changing like speed was, but as uh, the Y component goes to zero and then I guess increases in the negative direction, you see that, oh, it's uh, changing in a very kind of a simpler way. It's not a parabola, it's a linear curve. And uh, all this uh, uh, should match with how we describe motion under gravitational acceleration. That um, gravitational acceleration, when we describe it near the surface of the earth, 
it's a constant downward acceleration. In fact, if I look at this here, it's a constant downward acceleration. And you see how that downward acceleration affects the vertical component of velocity and not the horizontal component. So, so this is the thinking behind the steps we go through when we analyze projectile motion. That when you try to treat the motion as a whole, it's very complicated. It's uh, hard to just uh, swallow that whole thing as a whole. But when you break it up into uh, horizontal, uh, sorry, into horizontal and the vertical components of the motion, then you can, it's a simpler piece to analyze each. And depending on the problem you're solving, uh, later on you will have to kind of connect the both. So sometimes the question asks about, um, uh, so question could, I can imagine it asking about how uh, far does the ball travel before to the, when it reaches the top of the arc, then, um, then you kind of look at, okay, top of the arc, it's at this point here. And using the motion in the Y direction, you can figure out the duration of time. And using that duration of time, connecting it with the X component of velocity, you can look at how far it travels in that time. So, um, so yeah, that's a kind of illustration of projectile motion. And I hope, you know, it, this might be something familiar to a lot of people. The solution steps for projectile motion, probably that itself is familiar to many people. But sometimes uh, I know the biggest trap that I've seen students get into is where you know the steps for solving the problem, but you don't know why. <laughs> and that um, as you go into higher levels in physics and engineering, the understanding, the reasoning behind the matters uh, starts to matter more than knowing step-by-step -step process. So uh, I think I have enough time to demonstrate just one more thing here, which is um, kind of the, the kind of thing you can only do in simulation. Um, so, um, so, you know, when we say projectile motion, it's motion under gravitational acceleration. We can do what if scenarios. What if uh, we didn't have gravity? So I can imagine that I'm way out in space. I'm not, um, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, there's no gravity there. Uh, so I guess if I'm out in space, let me get rid of this so that it's not confusing. Then out in space with no gravity, it kind of looks like this, motion in a straight line. And I guess that'll relate to um, Newton's first and second law that we are covering this week. So, <laughs> so there's that. Um, the second thing is, it's something that we don't really get into this class a lot. It has to do with, um, so I spent a little bit of time in the first week talking about the vector description, how the vector description is independent of the axis that you might attach to something. And I think in this class, we do use quite often by default the straight axis. And later on, when we do inclined plane uh, problems, you will see us using a tilted axis, but even then, um, so something that I hope you will see uh, as you go into higher levels of math and physics is um, something um, kind of linear transformations and rotation of axis as a problem solving tool. So, um, so the, here the way the motion is described and uh, let me, that show gravity field, and you can kind of see with the, this is with a straight axis, and that's the motion with a straight axis. Um, it's all very, all right, fine, not, nothing surprising there. And um, I, what I want you to illustrate is you can uh, keep this uh, physical setup the, exactly the same, and describe the exact same physical picture with a rotated axis. And there will be situations where it's convenient to do that. It simplifies some things, it, um, it, 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 it simplifies some things. <laughs> and um, the one example of that you see uh, in this class is when we deal with inclined planes. But I think we present that as, not as us uh, applying a rotation transformation to the axis, but more as us uh, choosing a convenient set of axes which is right, but I just want you to show what kind of rotating axis looks like. I actually want you to um, find a way to do this in Algodo, but I couldn't find it. But what I can do is what rotating axis looks like is rotating the entire physical picture. So 
uh, this is kind of the physical picture that we started out with. And this is the motion that we saw. And if the software allowed it, it would uh, let me uh, rotate my axis so that I can rotate how these components are broken out. But failing that, what I can do is, okay, my axis are fixed, the software doesn't let me, I can imagine rotating my universe in the software. So let me do that. I'm going to just rotate everything. Um, let me make it 30 degrees. So I need to, uh, let me get rid of this again. And let me make this, oops. Uh, I need to, uh, let me define this plane that's at about 30 degrees. Uh, why did I, uh, so we go to find control mode. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure. Oh, I see. That's because I'm way out there. Okay, 30 degrees. All right. Uh, my, so my plane is now at 30 degrees. Um, but um, I need to rotate everything else at 30 degrees as well. And everything else includes uh, this initial velocity vector. So I need to make, um, instead of having it go at 45 degrees, I need to have an increase the angle by 30 degrees. So it'll be at 75 degrees relative to the original axis. And you can kind of see here the angle between this and this is now, um, now 45 degrees again, I think it is. And oh, and I need to change the direction of my gravitational field so that it's again perpendicular to the ground. Uh, so I think from 90, I think minus 60 will get me to that 30 degree. Yeah, so it's not perpendicular to the surface. All right, I, I think I, did I forget anything? Okay, I think I rotated everything so that, um, so, so one thing that, as so I'm rotating my universe <laughs> relative to the axis is that these components change. So before X and Y components, initially they have the same, uh, same size now the y component is bigger because I rotated my axis in a way so that um, the, the more of the velocity has the y, y component. But when I run it, so this is the motion. And if you kind of tilt your head and um, you know, tilt your axis back, then it's the same physical picture. Nothing physically has changed. The, only thing that has changed is how we describe the component. So anyways, uh, this is something that we don't really get into in this class. So I, <laughs> because we don't get into it, I wanted to show it as a kind of teaser foreshadowing for future classes you might be taking where this transformation of coordinate axis is a useful tool. Okay, I think that's every, all the time we have for this simulation. Unless there are questions, um, kind of help guide your intuition for projectile motion. Um, there's also your, there'll be your lab where you'll take real life uh, or real world data and um, use that to kind of look at it. And I think there's one lab exercise where I have you transform coordinates, whatever. Um, yeah, so 